From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing a formal impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump, how local lawmakers are reacting. Plus, it's National Voter Registration Day. We'll show you the push happening around the valley to get high schoolers involved in the political process. And poolside dynasty. We dive into the water with an Arizona school dominating the last three decades of swim competition as champs. Cronkite News starts now. Today, I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. I'm directing our six committees to proceed with their investigations under that umbrella of impeachment inquiry. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. Up first tonight, breaking news. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing the launch of a formal impeachment inquiry at 5 p.m. Eastern Time today. Good evening, I'm Marcella Bayetto. And I'm Jordan Elder. CNN is reporting 179 House Democrats are in support of an impeachment inquiry. 218 votes are needed in order to begin those proceedings. More Democrats started calling for an impeachment inquiry after a whistleblower came forward claiming Trump may have sought a foreign government's help in his reelection bid. Democrats are demanding information about whether President Trump improperly pressured the Ukrainian president to investigate Biden and his son, partly by withholding foreign aid. The president denied this. There was never any quid pro quo. The letter was beautiful. It was a perfect letter. Uh, it was unlike Biden, who, by the way, what he said was a horror. And ask how his son made millions of dollars from Ukraine, made millions of dollars from China, even though he had no expertise whatsoever, okay? So what he did was a real problem. With us, uh, there was no pressure applied, no nothing. President Trump also says he will release a complete transcript of the call with Ukraine's leaders tomorrow. The president suggests while Biden was vice president, he had Ukraine's prosecutor fired to squelch in an, an investigation of a company linked to his son. The Ukrainian prosecutor says he knows of no evidence for Trump's allegations against the Bidens. We have a president who believes there's no limit to his power. We have a president who believes he can do anything and get away with it. We have a president who believes he's above the law, pursuing the leader of another nation to investigate a political opponent to help win his election is not the conduct of an American president. President Trump is reacting on Twitter, calling this presidential harassment and saying they never even saw the transcript of the call, a total witch hunt. Members of our delegation in Washington are reacting. Republican Representative Andy Biggs put out a statement that reads in part, House Democrats could have used their time in the majority to work constructively with President Trump to sustain America's economic momentum, secure our border and lower health care costs. Instead, they have prioritized impeachment over the needs of, and prosperity of their country. And Democratic Representative Greg Stanton's statement reads in part, the mountain of credible evidence that the president has engaged in impeachable conduct continues to grow, including his own alarming admissions over the past several days. History will judge us for how we respond in this unique moment and for whether we have the courage to uphold the rule of law. So we want to know what you think now. Do you su now support Congress moving forward with the impeachment inquiry into President Trump's actions? Right now, 72% of you say yes. Just go to our Cronkite News Twitter and Facebook pages to join the heated debate. And for continuing coverage of the impeachment inquiry, find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Our other big story today, the weather. It may be another wet, rainy day across the valley as much as south central and southeastern Arizona remain under flash flood watches. We're still waiting to see if the National Weather Service confirms this was an actual tornado touching down in New River yesterday. They did share a graphic today saying the state averages about four tornadoes a year. 
The other major weather phenomenon people are still talking about this afternoon is hail. Antoinette posting this image on social media showing the dime-sized hail that slammed North Scottsdale. And Danny tweeting this video near Camelback in the 51, saying the hail was actually coming into the store where he was ducking for shelter. We even saw some dust sweep through the Phoenix area between downpours yesterday. And lots of people are tweeting photos of the incredible lightning last night. We've now learned two homes were struck in the metro Phoenix area. Thankfully, no one was hurt. But check out this close call. Cat capturing the glory of Mother Nature in the Scottsdale skies. As for right now, neighborhoods are scrambling to clean up the mess before more storms strike. Winds downing trees and knocking over street signs. Many bracing for more of the same today and tomorrow, especially those living on the streets. Frankie McLister shows us what steps are being taken to help people who are homeless when severe weather strikes. Frankie? Yeah, Marcelo Jordan. I mean, as Valley residents saw those crazy storms come through yesterday, it directly affected the homeless population. And people who are advocates for that population said that their resources just are not enough. Last night, um, we sheltered almost 200 people, um, and a lot of that was because of the weather. As the rough weather closed in on the valley Monday night, homeless shelters were opening their doors. So many of us that live in Arizona were often so thankful for the rain, and, and I myself am thankful for that. Um, but. I would challenge people to think about that downpour last night and um, think about what it would be like if you were living on the street um, and having to experience that kind of extreme weather. Um, it can be really harsh on someone who has no place to take shelter. According to the latest point in time count, there were just over 6,500 people who were homeless in Maricopa County back in January. That's a 5% increase in comparison to the year before. Advocates who work with shelters say they're being forced to turn people away, even during extreme weather, due to a lack of financial resources. We were able to go up to 275 last night. Tonight, we'll see how many people come. But as we close the shelter down, what you're going to see is people standing at the gate, please, you know, don't close. It, it's really bad. When we closed the overflow shelter a year ago for lack of funding, um, people dispersed a, and you, more encampments grew. So we're not addressing the issue. Those who are homeless are extremely vulnerable when it comes to weather. Elements such as triple digit heat or flash flooding can be a matter of life or death. Weather exposure also means that without shelter, we're risking lives. Yeah, and with more chances of rain tonight, those shelter officials told me that they're going to have as many beds as possible, but we'll hope that they won't hit max capacity. In Phoenix, downtown, I'm Frankie McLister for Cronkite News. Right now, tensions are high surrounding gun laws, but one local store owner says his sales have never been higher. Alpha Dogs Firearms, a Tempe gun shop, sold quadruple the number of AR-15 rifles they usually do in just a few hours. The owners say that's because of a Facebook post that went viral concerning presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke made a comment at the Democratic presidential debate last week saying, quote, Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. In response, the store owners created a special on these guns, naming it the Beto Special. So we, the store put out a sale right the night of that Democratic debate uh, saying that we will discount the ARs and AKs that we have after Beto O'Rourke's comments of I'm going to take your ARs and AKs. Uh, the tweet, the Facebook post and message went viral and we went from maybe 20,000-ish followers into the millions overnight. Just a few days after this flash sale, gun manufacturer Colt announced it will stop producing AR-15s for the consumer market. Suspects in several recent mass shootings use that type of weapon. Goodyear has passed an ordinance making it the first city in the Valley to raise the legal age to purchase tobacco products from 18 to 21. The ordinance passed unanimously yesterday, banning the sale of electronic cigarettes, tobacco and similar products. The new rule bans smoking and vaping at schools, school events, public parks, trails and prohibits sales of smoking and vaping materials to anyone under 21 years old. The move comes as cases of respiratory illness linked to vaping have seen a dramatic rise. 
Arizona is known for its copper, but building a mine to extract it is a lengthy process with both environmental and cultural challenges. Resolution Copper wants to build a mine on land that is currently known as the Oak Flat Campground near Superior and the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Public hearings throughout September drew in dozens of people looking to challenge the copper mine, which would destroy sacred tribal land. Leanne Bighorse says it's important for Resolution Copper to hear their testimony. They leave out our voice. So by coming here, we felt that, you know, the indigenous, the, the, the voice of the tribes will be heard. Uh, you know, we, we brought our children with us because it affects them. It's going to affect their future. It would take a decade to build the mine. It would operate for 40 years and provide 40 billion pounds of copper. The mine would then go through five to 10 years of reclamation. It would be one of the largest and deepest copper mines in the U.S., which raises concerns about the land for people like Michael Gettins. It will never be what it is now, ever again. And that's water, that's wildlife, that's, that's our well-being. And, and who knows the health ramifications that it's going to have. And Copper and the U.S. Forest Service released a 1,300-page environmental impact statement in August. But many attendees at the Santan Valley hearing raised questions about contamination from the mine, as well as other environmental issues. There is one more public hearing on October 8th in Queen Valley, and the public comment window closes on November 7th. Cronkite News will keep you updated on this project as it unfolds. receive more than $43 million in federal infrastructure grants, including Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow announced the investments would be used to improve the five Arizona airports. Specifically, Phoenix Sky Harbor will get two grants, totaling nearly $22 million. Tucson International Airport will be allotted $9 million for runway improvements. Still to come, the efforts underway right now to get Arizonans pumped to go to the polls. And a young climate activist under fire for what she had to say to world leaders after the break. All of its children had come to the Mother Church of Country Music. It was almost like a badge of honor that you had to uh, bring your culture with you to the table. That's why Bob Wills and his guys brought us Western music. That's why Hank Williams brought the South with him from Honky Tonks. Johnny Cash brought the Black Lamb Dirt of Arkansas. Bill Monroe brought music out of Kentucky bluegrass music. Willie Nelson brought his poetry from Texas. Patsy Cline brought her heartache from Virginia. I mean, it, it was the most wonderful parade of sons and daughters of America that brought their hearts and their souls and their experiences, and it gave us a great era in country music. Today, thousands of people are registering to vote. It's part of National Voter Registration Day. Cronkite News reporter Isabella Holsizer attended several events and joins us live. Many of these nonpartisan events were held at high schools across the valley in order to get those who will be over 18 at the next election ready to vote. Phoenix hosted a voter registration party. Students who are or will turn 18 by the November election were invited. So it makes our voices be heard and it's a uh, change in the community. Students listened to a speech by Senator Kate Brophy McGee. Then they filled out their registration paperwork. Over 700 students were invited to the event and around 500 registered to vote. But according to Blanca Cayasso of the Arizona Center for Empowerment, the work does not end today. My registering to vote is the first step, and the next step is actually voting. So I'm very excited for um, the 2020 elections and continuing to register thousands on thousands more students to vote. According to 2018 census data, less than 50% of 18 to 24-year-old Arizonans are registered to vote. And in the 2016 presidential election, less than half of the 18 to 24-year-olds in the state voted. Last year, more than 800,000 people registered to vote on this day. In the Media Center, Isabella Holsizer, Cronkite News.
asked on our Cronkite News Twitter feed if you're registered to vote yet. So far, 92% of you said yes, and 8% said no, but they plan to. Several Arizona lawmakers have signed on to an open letter urging President Trump not to cut the number of refugees admitted into the country next year. The Welcoming Refugees 2020 letter is requesting the president raise the number of refugees admitted from 45,000 to 95,000. That figure is the average for admitted refugees that presidents have allowed going back to Ronald Reagan's administration. The Trump administration was considering reducing the cap to zero as recently as this summer. Over 380 state and local elected officials have signed the letter so far, 36 of whom are from Arizona. One of the top trending stories online today is about a teen climate activist taking on the United Nations. 16-year-old Greta Thunberg delivered an emotional speech at the UN Climate Summit yesterday, scolding world leaders for not doing enough to save the planet. The Swedish teenager delivered her speech just minutes before she and 15 other children filed a formal complaint against the UN. They claim five world powers violated human rights by not taking action to stop climate change. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Thunberg recently spent two weeks traveling to the U.S. on a zero emissions sailboat. She's known for staging weekly sit ins outside Parliament in Sweden. Those led to more than 100 similar protests across the globe last week. After the break, the Trump administration announcing an end to California's strict emissions requirements. We'll explore the impact, including the risk of adding more smog to the state. The EPA is slamming the brakes on high vehicle emission standards. Last Thursday, the Trump administration moved to revoke the Clean Air Act waiver of 2013, which allows California to enforce its own stricter emission standards to combat the state's problem with smog. Reporter, reporter Kyla Wilcher is in Santa Monica showing the impact this restriction may have. LA is notorious for smoke and fog, or smog, because it's the first city to address the issue of smog in the skies. LA officials created the nation's first air quality regulator back in 1947, but it wasn't until 1984 that the state started mandating smog checks for all cars. Now California could be facing cutbacks to their smog standards. Air pollution, especially from cars and fossil fuels, is not just an L.A. problem. According to 2019 rankings from the American College of Sports Medicine, Long Beach, California ranked worst in air quality, but six cities in the valley round out the top ten. Suzanne Paulson is a professor of atmospheric chemistry at UCLA. She says the L.A. area's geography traps smog as it forms. We have a, a very clean city as cities go with some sort of conditions that are specific to local, um, our location. Paulson has spent the last 30 years in Southern California and says she's noticed dramatic improvements in the air quality since she moved to L.A. decades ago. Most fall afternoons um, 
a, a wall of smog would roll in. Chris Chavez works for the Coalition for Clean Air. He grew up in Long Beach, and as a child who had asthma, he understands the impacts of air pollution firsthand. You know, pollution definitely impacts the people that live there, and uh, certainly um, is a major concern of uh, residents in that region. While California has made large strides in air quality, Chavez and Paulson say the state has a long way to go. At the end of the day, if California's need, going to have the tools to protect its citizens and com combat climate change, uh, these rolling back these standards and freezing or revoking California's waiver uh, is certainly going to stand in the way of that. On Tuesday, Trump administration officials told California to abide by their standards or risk losing funding for highways. In Santa Monica, Kyla Wilcher, Cronkite News. Now we're joined with the Miller Thomas. Please tell us, are we going to be seeing any rain chances our way? So you might not see any rain tonight, but expect some in the next couple of days. But as always, let's start with your Tuesday weather report. So as you guys are getting off work, temperatures right now are gonna be sitting at 86 degrees around 5 p.m. Now I know you guys are hitting that Taco Tuesday tonight at the D-backs game. So you're looking at 82 degrees around the start game time. Then temperatures can actually drop to below 80 around 10 p.m. at 78 degrees. Now let's see your valley highs for tomorrow. So guys, fall has officially started. As you can see, the average temperature this time of year is 97 degrees. We're gonna have 88 in Tempe, 88 in Phoenix, and out west is gonna be 86 in Surprise. Let's see what it's gonna look like tomorrow when you guys wake up. So you might actually need a sweater like mine because it's gonna be 75 degrees when you guys wake up. And then as you see, storm chances, storm chances are gonna increase as the day moves on. 20% when you guys wake up and then all the way to 50% at 6 p.m. Let's see your seven day forecast. Wednesday, Thursday, chance of uh, storms. And then Friday, nice and sunny, but let's see how your weekend's gonna look. Sunny all weekend, Saturday and Sunday, 89, 90. Then Monday, Tuesday, also Sunday. Uh, also sunny, and then 88, 88, Monday, Tuesday. I'm Miller Thomas with your Cronkite News Weather Watch. Miller, those 80s look beautiful. Coming up on Cronkite News, we're taking a dip into a local school's poolside dynasty and show you how they've remained state champs for over three decades. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. On the next Arizona horizon, another Valley City considers a ban on vaping for anyone under the age of 21. And we hear from local country artist J. David Sloan. Arizona PBS continues to air the Ken Burns documentary on country music. name, Chanel Miller, the Stanford sexual assault victim, speaks out. That's Tuesday on the PBS NewsHour. An Arizona high school has found success beneath the surface of the swimming pool. In fact, they've taken a state title every year for the last 31 years. Wow. <laughs> Cronkite sports reporter Corey Kirk joins us from the newsroom. Corey, what secrets lie poolside at Brophy College Prep? The Brophy Broncos have hung a state championship banner every year for the past three decades. We joined the team in the pool to find out how the Broncos keep their heads above water, they told us it's all about supporting the swimmer next to you. It's 5.30 a.m. These Brophy College Preparatory boys are already in the pool, swimming their laps as the sun rises. We're always just hungry to get better, and you know I feel like you know, that, that's just allowed us to build this base, this foundation of hard work and you know brotherhood. The last time Brophy didn't win the state championship, 1987 when gas prices were 90 cents a gallon and Ronald Reagan was still president. Leading the team now is second year head coach Darren Brubaker. Let's think about your breathing. A former collegiate swimmer and the fourth head coach during this run of 31 consecutive state titles. He doesn't let the pressure of maintaining this dominance affect his approach. Help motivate me 
but in the end, it doesn't matter how many wins you make. I think it's important to keep the holistic side of the Brophy tradition. Thus, Brubaker incorporated a philosophy with his entire team to pay respect to the foundation that was laid for them, telling his athletes to remember that they stand on the shoulders of giants. As some former swimmers have gone on to compete in college, and even Gary Hall Jr., class of 93, who is a 10-time Olympic medalist. Being on the Brophy Swim and Dive team, you know, there it comes with a reputation, it comes with an expectation to be a leader, it comes with an expectation to push yourself in and out of the pool. Though they've had routine success, Coach Brubaker wants to worry about the bigger picture. He calls it focusing not on the times, but the people, with the friendships they make through this program and the amount of fun they have. In the end, they, these guys are still kids. They're still growing, and I want them to look back at their experience at Brophy as fun, as, you know what, I did have a great time. That attitude gives these athletes a chance to strengthen their bond and build a better skill set outside of the pool. The leadership skills I've learned and just friends I've made are going to last me a lifetime, and that's enough in itself. Though 31 straight seasons of state titles hang over their heads, the Brophy Swim and Dive team strives to strengthen each other through competition and in life. After hosting their annual Invitational with Xavier Prep this past weekend, the Broncos are now heading to Tempe, where they will be facing Corona Del Sol this Thursday, September 26th. First events start at 4 p.m. In the Broadcast Center, Corey Kirk, Cronkite Sports. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. And this is what...